Francis Chat Wim. Really delighted to welcome Robert Neuhauser from Siemens today. Um, uh, both Antonio and I have previously, um, in our careers, worked for Siemens, and and so it's and Siemens is still a, a big customer of our own employer. So we're, um, we're 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 closely interested in in the work that Siemens are doing and how they work and 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 so on because it's close to our hearts. So Robert, we're delighted to have you with us today. Can you tell us a bit about your role and the work that you're doing within within Siemens? So actually, currently, I'm I'm uh, globally responsible for people and leadership, which in our case also includes all the topics around diversity and inclusion, because we think this is kind of an integral part if you talk about people and leadership in the in the future. <laughs> so, you, you obviously recognize immediately how important diversity and inclusion is in this whole package. Therefore, we combine all this together. Beyond that, I'm, I'm responsible for all the um, top talent development within Siemens, for the top placements within Siemens, for the top 300 functions, for all aspects of performance management, how we do this across Siemens, and also how we think and act about career development across Siemens globally. Excellent. And, and, and we were saying off, off camera before, um, Antonio and I moved to Atlas a number of years ago, but we've watched the change in Siemens as an organization and the change in people within Siemens and how people are dealt with, with, with real interest because uh, we, we were leaving a, a very structured Pretty rigid organization when, when we left. Um, and it appears from the outside, at least, that that's changed really quite significantly. And there's a real focus on, on greater focus on diversity and, and everything else. And, and we had the real privilege to have Jürgen Meyer come and speak at our, our diversity expo in, in the summer at, in Atos at the UK. He gave a, a great speech about getting into the mindset of people and and about um, understanding his own um, innate biases. Um, he, he talked about um, out and actually being in the closet as an engineer um, and how actually, if anything, he was overcompensating his biases because he was uh, he was gay, and and so was acting up even even more so. So I, I think it was a really fascinating uh, talk, and and it was a, one of the first times I've I've heard a a, a CEO, a real senior leader, talk quite so openly about their own experience and and, and frailty. So that that for me was was a, a brilliant moment. I know you've been doing a, a lot of work on. Um, around the topics of unconscious bias. Um, why is it so important for, for Siemens to, to eliminate this unconscious bias? What, what's the business impact of? Yeah. So for, first of all, before starting, I'd, I'd say that unconscious bias per se is not bad. Every one of us has it. Sure. it. It helps us to decide quickly sometimes, so, so it's not per se bad. Um, but but I'm happy that you that you mentioned the transition theme and so on, and also mentioning Jürgen, who is one of our role models, and we have quite a few of them in the meantime who are very open about talking about about their experiences and the role of unconscious bias and in what they experienced. Why so important for us? You mentioned Siemens is changing from being very structured uh, hardware seller. We are, have become the second largest software company in Europe, which many people do not know actually in terms of headcount, uh, revenue, and, and things like that. And by this, we had to change, obviously, because the business is completely different. You have to take much faster decisions, but on the other hand, you have also have to include much more different viewpoints on, on things. And so we invested quite heavily in our helping our people to understand what unconscious bias can help them in terms of fast decision making. <laughs> But on the other hand, sensibilizing them that sometimes making this fast decision might be exactly the wrong thing. And so it's kind of this interplay of being able to recognize where can I trust my biases because they are the summary of my experiences, basically. Um, and where do I need to be extremely careful not to be fooled by my own unconscious biases? 
And this is so important in a fast moving world as we are in now to be able to make these distinctions consciously. And therefore we put quite, quite some effort in, in the whole topic of unconscious bias, which is also by the way, understanding it and working on it consciously helps you to drive diverse organizations, obviously, because unconscious bias can be one of the biggest barriers to true diversity and inclusion. So those are great and, and, and really um, important points. And, and I think if we extrapolate that from the decision-making process of people, we're also going into the age of algorithms. Yes. So, um, you know, the unconscious biases that we had, we, we called heuristics, you know, these were the decision-making aids yeah. that we had previously. We're now um, digitizing those heuristics and also digitizing those biases. So, so understanding this is, uh, is, is, is really of key importance if we want to um, be effective and, and take diversity and, and the benefits of diversity into our automated decision-making processes and be um, more effective, but also more equitable. Um, I'm, I'm sure actually, Deborah's got a question. Yeah. Actually, yeah. May, may, I, may I add yeah, something to this? Because I think you you touched a very very important point. The role of digitalization as as a tool in avoiding unconscious bias or helping us in, in supporting decisions. And as as most of us know, the, even second order artificial intelligence doesn't help that much because it actually, as you said, just learns from the experience that we have. And our past was not typically a past of diversity and inclusion. So if you train artificial intelligence by the past it will make exactly the same mistakes that we <laughs> might have made over the last 20 years. However, there are examples where digitalization can help us to overcome this. And I've, because you mentioned, uh, mentioned our UK colleagues before, they, they run, an, run an experiment um, for hiring apprentices and, and really based it on very simple digital behavioristic measurements. And the interesting outcome was, as soon as they started to implement this, the, the number of, of apprentices that got through the first level of interviews jumped from 16% to 32, because suddenly we talked fact-based and not unconscious bias-based about, about a lot of things. So while we need to be very, very careful on the artificial intelligence and learning side that we do not reproduce our biases, on the other hand, Digitalization can help us to get things structured and by this way also more fair in some some aspects. Yeah, in, indeed, um, and I will let you talk soon, Deborah. Uh, um, for instance, Microsoft, if you um, look into some of their products, what they're doing is they're they're not only enabling spell checking, but they're enabling in you know in the deep in the proofing tools, you can turn on options that look for biased language. Absolutely. So, so, so then you can use um, automation and artificial intelligence to help remove bias as well as it sort of creeping in there. So sorry, Deborah, I, I just wanted to follow no, that. No, 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 that's, no, that's a really good point. And I know, Robert, before we went on air, you were talking about um, the work that you are doing to really help your team understand the direction that Siemens wants to go in and why. And you were yeah. mentioning an engineer, engineering saying, engineering saying, yeah, okay, get it, get it. We get it's good for Siemens. We, but tell me how it impacts what I'm trying to do. And I just thought that was, I thought that was such an important point because the reality is, I, okay, you told me to do it. Because you're my boss. Get it. Get. But why, why should I, as an individual, care? And if we can get you to care and understand why this is going to make you a better engineer and you're going to be better at your job. I think not only is that successful for Siemens, but it's going to be successful for that engineer wherever they go. So yes. uh, I was just hoping you wouldn't mind going into that a little yes. bit. Yes, ab absolutely. This is this is really important and drives how we think about it because it doesn't matter whether it makes it doesn't matter for our engineers whether it's for Siemens, it's for right. them. And and the question that we ask ourselves: how to sneak into the brains? of these engineers so that they see, ah, this is cool. And so the, the first thing that we realized was engineers typically love to understand how things work. 
So we basically designed training concepts that were not about, look, uh, we expect this from you now, and here you have to comply. But rather, can we, can we talk about how your brain works? Because as soon as we got them at this point, they said, this is interesting. I, I love technology. I love science. I want to understand how my brain works. And we talked about not, not about, look, how you must make better decisions, but talk to them. Do you know how your brain takes decisions? So basically separating the person from, from its brain to some extent, so they can kind of relate to it as an artificial thing that they want to understand. Um, and based on this, we did design, design trainings. And, and by this, we got their interest. And then the whole training was not about, look, there's kind of a meta level on how you do this, but really, but if you understand how your brain works, you can take better decisions. And then suddenly people recognize, whoa, that's something <laughs> that even helps me directly. And so this was kind of the idea on how to get into the brains of, uh, of our, our people and really make them think what is in for me. And this, this is probably one of the most fascinating success stories I ever had in my career. So we, we put this in a, in a very simple online training. There are lots of debates on whether unconscious bias trainings work or not work or how much they work. So we put it in a training and put it online and said, if you want to do this, you can do it, but we don't expect you to do it. And in the meantime, we are at 200,010, 200,010 of our employees who did voluntarily this training because people told them this is kind of interesting. Just do it, it's interesting, it's fun. Does it immediately change the whole culture? Obviously not. Um, but it opened up their thinking and got it away from Siemens is telling you you need to get more diverse to, oh, this is cool how my brain works. I, I like to take better decisions. And by this, now we can sneak in more things about do you recognize how this influences for example, your hiring decision, which is secondary. So that's kind of a cool, cool thing yeah. I wanted to share because we were completely surprised <laughs> by how this worked. Right. Probably it's a one in a lifetime thing, yeah. And that, I think that is so fascinating because you talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and, and why should Siemens care? Well, you talked about how big Siemens is and you're everywhere and you're growing. So of course we get that Siemens Siemens wants to get the best employees, but it's it's so fascinating too when you think about you are going to be building artificial intelligence or you are building artificial intelligence. Yeah. So if, if I understand how my beautiful brain works and how other people's brains work, that's going to make me build better artificial intelligence. And so it, it is, I'm fascinated with why Beyond the obvious, and I don't know if you can even answer this, Robert, why does Seaman care about this? I'm so glad that you do, but why? Tell, tell us why um, Siemens cares. Sorry. And I, I I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is a very, very fair question. And indeed, we, we talk quite a bit about the why also for Siemens. So why is it important for the individual? We just talked. Why so important for Siemens? I, the, the major change that we saw and, and uh, uh, I think uh, you and Neil addressed this. Siemens came from a very structured, uh, nearly Tayloristic mach machinery. Um, actually, and, and there weren't so many decisions. You just had to work efficiently in your micro context. Now, as said, we are, we are, much of our growth business is in digital or digitally enabled businesses that that have much faster decision process, but on the other hand, are also global in a sense, do I really understand in detail how this product will be used in, in India or somewhere else? How will it be used by people from different backgrounds? We just don't know. You can't run this out of a single location or a single mindset. You need to look at it from very different mindsets. And we can really correlate this whenever we have businesses where we where we are diverse, we are much better in off digital offerings. In businesses that are very monocultural, we run into growth problems. And, and you see this if you have so many businesses as we do, you just see it. 
And, and this is basically where, where we have this, why we're doing it. That yes, um, we need to be careful not to tell our people that they were kind of stupid for 20 years and now they need to become diverse. Rather than, there was a business of the past that was very structured. There it was not that important from a business point of view, from an ethical point of view, that's still as important as today. But from business, perhaps not that important. But but no, there's no no doubt that it's obvious that that it basically is the driver for success going forward. So, Robert, answer. so, so we have been talking about the work that Zimmer has been doing internally, but this is an area that you can't do it alone. You work. We have part. You have partners, uh, customers. How important is uh, is uh, cooperation with other institutions and, and organizations in order, in order to make real change in society? Um, it, it is important and, and we, we do this on, on various levels. This starts from top-down messages from our CEO to those topics, participation, participation in, in many initiatives, specifically on the LGBTI area, where we try to be very present uh, whatever is possible in a in a specific region, we'll try to do this. Um, just supporting by being there and making clear that that a company like Siemens that stands for quality for reliability is heavily investing in this. I think this is one part. Obviously, network to other other organization helps. On the other hand, we should not overestimate the impact that you can have as a single company. You can contribute somewhat to this topic and interlink to other things, but obviously Siemens alone <laughs> is just a contributor to change in society, but never be kind of the only driver. Yeah, that's great. And, and do, do, you see, do you see yourself as also someone that can help uh, partners and uh, driving this as well? We can talk about it. So I'm, I'm very open, yeah. Um, it it helps it helps talking about it and, and setting examples. It you can help by exchanging how what things were successful, what other things were successful in our company. So really driving things, and we do this globally. On the other hand, and that is also what I meant. You always have to respect and be careful in what the region and the respective culture you're talking to is is able to to accept at this very point in time and this differs very much as we are a global company the the level of of pushing things is completely different in the us compared to some other regions on the world and this is always kind of a balance that that you have to have to be aware of there's no one size fits all globally for how to make this most effective that's great. Um, we have a, a, a think tank within our organization. We call it the scientific community. And, and recently we were we published a paper, Journey 2022. And we, in, in that, we were talking about tensions and inertia. And, and, and that's what you've got, really, when yeah. um, when you have all of these different things at play with uh, with the different identities, national identities, culture, etc. So absolutely here, because um, in the area I work in disability, even just the discussion of language um, can be fraught with, with difficulty. Um, we were having a discussion today with all of these sort of international companies sat around the table. And I do believe that collectively we can make a difference, we can move the, the, the agenda forward. But people will go, well, which language do we use? Because different countries have different cultures. And in the end, someone said, I've decided on the ostrich strategy, which is I'm going to stick my head in the sand consciously about language and just start <laughs> doing stuff. And we've called it the ostrich strategy. We're going to say we know that, that this is not going to be the right language for everyone, but we're, we're, we have an intention to do the right thing. So um, knowing that Siemens is, is active in the area of inclusion, you, you recently won the, the Inclusion Prize, the Max Spohr Prize. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yes, that, that was something we were very proud of because 
indeed for those people who don't know this this price it seems to be a german price but if you're a uh, international company what you basically have to provide is what you do globally and, and it's going really into details on on basically the whole system on on, on how uh, how you drive this um what what people told us there um, what they really liked and, and what set Siemens apart, in, at least in this competition, um, was that we made this very strong link to is it has a business impact. We do this not just for fun or because it's the fashion of the decade, but because we strongly believe it has a fundamental impact on our business. And that was something where I was really proud of because this was indeed beyond the thing that I just said before in terms of the how we do it um, to, to basically how do we get into the minds of our people. Also really being a role model in, in putting it on the table. We don't do this just because it's fashionable or might be seen as fashionable or because the public opinion might force us to do it. but because we believe that is essential for for our our growth and and future at Siemens and I was so happy that that this was exactly the point that they pointed out beyond all other things that you do this systematically blah, 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 all all things you measure so, but this was the thing that convinced us and that was uh, that was great we loved it that, that, that's fantastic and uh, and I, I think that there is this cultural mindset change that is required for future organizations to be successful. Um, and the fact that you're concentrating rather than on the metrics, but on how people think about stuff is, is really a very important differentiator between leaders and, and, and followers. So I think that's, that's hugely important. I, I know, um, Antonio has also got a, another question around sort of management stuff, so I'm going to hand over to Antonio. Mm -hmm. no, uh, 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 what I want to know, Robert, is you know, going back to your to, to your career and to your uh, uh, experiences, and, and if, if you look back, how can you tell how did, uh, did your personal experience on, on inclusion reflect in your day-to-day? activities that you are uh, uh, working on today? <laughs> it's a, such a big question. <laughs> How do I answer this in short? Um, in, in essence, perhaps for those who don't know me, I, I spent most of my life in different business functions, running large businesses for Siemens, serving as a CEO, ran large crisis project, did an R&D, come from a science background actually um, was responsible for high-tech Chinese-German joint venture. So what do I get from there? I, I think one of the things is I learned that everyone has strong unconscious biases and they can hinder discussion massively. So understanding quickly what kind of biases do you have, what kind of biases do I have, how can we get around them to find solutions was one thing that I really learned. And you learn it the hard way in the early times of your career. Later on, you realize what's happening and, and get more open to it and, and more effective and efficient. That was one thing. The other thing was um, a, a colleague of mine always says, nothing changes perspectives like changing perspectives. And I think this is very true. So having worked on different sides on, on things, just immediately get, get kind of a control mechanism on your unconscious biases in terms of, oh yeah, this is how I think currently. If I would be there, I would have probably different experience. So you, if you're able to change perspectives in your career, you're much more likely to be able to quickly recognize your own biases and other people's biases and, and helps to work, work effectively which is also something I advise all, all my mentees that are asking for career advice. The most important thing you can do is change perspective as often as you can, because this helps you in a world that is more and more interconnected and collaborative. 
this was probably now from the big thing, just one small part, but. Um. No, it's a great answer though, it's a great answer. Robert, just for a second, I, I assume everybody knows what we're talking about when we're talking about unconscious bias, but just in case somebody's watching and they're curious what we're meaning, can, can you give a couple of examples of unconscious bias? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll try to, yeah. Um, so science has distinguished many different kinds of unconscious bias. Basically unconscious bias means um, I make a shortcut in my brain, putting a situation or people into a box and say, I'm not looking at the situation or the, or the person. I just say, oh, you're kind of this box and typically this box has this and this attributes. So this is unconscious bias. And, and you can think of nearly everything of it. It can be, take me as an example, I'm a German male. Yeah, so you would say German male, probably he's quite reasonable, quality oriented, um, probably on time. That are automatically those kind of biases that you might have with me. Perhaps you might also have negative ones, but I don't want to go into those. Um, that would be unconscious bias. Another unconscious bias uh, is, uh, is related to age. Yeah. Some people have a strong unconscious bias in terms of people that are older are not as innovative. Right. Good one. Good one. Sometimes this is true, sometimes it's not true. It's an unconscious bias. Be careful not to put people in a box and just say, I don't look at you, I look at the box. Um, and the same things, by the way, happens also to, uh, to decision making, um, not only people related, but also situation related. Yeah, this is the typical situation of X. I know it sometimes, yes, you have experience, so the bias is to decide like this, but sometimes you need to look closer. Perhaps it's not the situation that is fitting this box. So this is about unconscious bias and you'll find it everywhere. Age, religions, nationalities, gender, beliefs, <laughs> whatever you can put the box around it stereotyping but it's it's not even conscious stereotyping it just happens right but yes. I'm, I'm very interested in, in in one of the ones that you mentioned because age is age is a really pressing issue so so um there are two really significant mega trends that are interrelated and, and those are age and disability because as we age we're likely to acquire disability so so deborah antonio and i are constantly talking about this but but um germany is one of the most rapidly aging um, populations in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this must be changing the, the attitude. In the workforces are going to get older. They're going to continue to get older. We're going to have to relearn and learn new skills as we, and acquire new skills as, as we age and continue to work. And our attitudes to work are also going to have to change. So how do we sort of tackle the issue because aging is one of those things where I think the, the bias is quite deeply entrenched uh, you know because even what we're seeing in in the tech industry is this you know the the bias towards youth is very strong you know it's like oh yeah you know let's, let's employ lots of young people because they're going to have some great ideas it's like well yeah but you, what about the experience what about the the knowledge of how stuff works it doesn't have to be just technology so how do we how do we address that and, and what are the benefits of actually um, encouraging people uh, who are older to stay in tech and get back into tech and, and how can that benefit organizations like Siemens? Yeah, I, I think very, very valid question. Um, I'd like to address a couple of different things. Sure. First, of, first of all, for Siemens, this is not a new, new challenge. The, there are a company that has basically five generations working within, within the company. Um, and indeed, I have quite a few talk, talks and, and uh, discussions with my colleagues from Google, uh, from, from other tech companies that basically now start asking us that you guys have five generations of workforce in your company. Yeah. You seem to be successful. We have only basically one and a half generations of workforce. We know that we are going into running into a similar structure as you have. What are you doing um, to be still successful? Because our mindset is you probably get not successful as you have a distributed workforce across age. 
so they get quite interested and, and ask uh, interesting yeah, they ask us for some advice as we do on some other things on, on that one i think now jumping into what what you can do the first is obviously on the cognitive stuff and the learning stuff just provide the opportunity for lifelong learning also within the company and really support this so Siemens currently spends around about 600 million a year in learning activities 600 million euro a year in learning activities um, because in most of our businesses we know that the half time of knowledge is so fast that we permanently need to retrain our people so this is just addressing the kind of training skills topic the other part is obviously um over over time now very specific over time the aspirations are changing some sometimes people have times where they love to push for careers and there are other, other times where it is not about career i want to optimize now life work life balance and we see, by the way, more and more, that's not early career, early talents for career, L later stages for life balance is kind of like, like this. Yeah. So, so being able to offer very flexible, flexible models on this helps enormously. And I, I think there are few companies out there that offer that broad range of flexibility from the traditional sabbaticals to all kind of working models. You can imagine nearly everyone in Siemens probably has everyone that every one that you can imagine. So that are also things that are important. So That's supporting fantastic. and training, supporting on flexibility, helping people who need to help others. Sometimes they need to have time off. That are exactly the things that you can contribute. Carers, carers' responsibilities are a big factor in people wanting um, flexible working. And Atos is also a, a, an organisation that's got five generations. We've got a very similar profile, unsurprisingly, since of, because yeah. of our heritage. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we we face those same challenges and and find that flexibility is really important. Thank you so much. It's been a really fascinating chat. We. Um, we've reached the end of our, our allotted time. I need to thank Barclays and Mike Cleartex for their support to keep us running over four years now. Um, so um, once again, thank you very much, Robert. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.